It is definitely a pleasure to be here. I want to take a moment to thank the hosts, the organizers. I um, want to say uh, really how grateful I am that you kept me as a keynote, even though there was campaigns to get me taken off of this panel. Um, this is the reality that we as Muslims and many interfaith leaders in Tennessee live with. You know, the RCC is here, you have a great mission, you all are doing great work, but there are many, including those in our state, who don't agree of the work that we are doing. So what do I do? Um, I am the Director of Policy and Administration with the American Center for Outreach. The American Center for Outreach, or ACO, is a nonpartisan political advocacy organization that was created to ensure um, that the Muslim voice was heard politically. Our goal is not only to ensure that we are heard, but that we as a Muslim community are engaged in the political and civic process so that issues such as the 2011 anti-Sharia bill never happen again to our community, um, but also to no other community in the state of Tennessee. Many might think it's a very unpopular time to be Muslim in the United States. We've seen a rise in Islamophobia. We've seen a rise in hate crimes against Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim, Arab, of Middle Eastern descent. A few days ago, a gentleman walking in a store with his sister, who happens to cover like myself, was shot and killed by a white supremacist simply because he was walking with his sister who was a Muslim. Not too long ago, we had the shooting at a, the Wisconsin Goodwater, the Sikh temple. Once again, the motives and the attack was to attack perceived Muslims or those who look and sound like me. Here in Tennessee, I've watched a mosque be burned down to the ground. I have watched construction sites be vandalized. I have watched and witnessed massive protests and lawsuits against my community. And I've also dealt with laws that were directly attacking me and outlawing me from practicing my faith simply because some did not agree. Where is this coming from? Why us? What have we done? Why now? These are the questions that my community asks on a regular basis. These are the questions that I have to ask, and these are the questions I have to answer to when dealing with youth in our community. In a recent report by the Council of American Islamic Relations, they found that the inner core of the US-based Islamophobic network enjoyed access to over $119 million and total revenue from 2008 to 2011. Let that number sink in, over $119 million in a few years. These groups in the inner core are tightly knit, and the key players benefit from high salaries. And these high salaries are an outcome of encouraging the American public to fear Muslims in Islam. That sounds interesting, right? $119 million. Oof, I could do a lot with $119 million. But what was really disturbing for us as Muslims and as Tennesseans was that Tennessee was mentioned more than any other state in this report. More than any other states for the, the hate, hate crimes that occurred, for the individuals involved in this report and funding these groups. So that's the reality what we, with what we deal with. But as a Muslim American, I have to take a step back and realize the historical context that all this fits into. Sadly, whether we want to acknowledge or not, America has a sad history of othering a segment of its population. We other those we do not know, those who look or sound different. And as long as we can deem them to be foreign, different, strange, then it is okay for us to take away their rights. This is the reality that we saw 
with Native Americans, African Americans, Japanese American, Chinese Americans, Latinos, Muslims, and even the LGBT community. This is a sad history that we deal with as Americans. And with every, every group that I have mentioned, as long as we are allowed to exclude them from rights and citizenship, then it is okay for us to isolate and attack. Then it becomes okay for us to consider them as perpetual foreigners, even in their own country. We have seen a rise in Islamophobia. Yes, there is a historical cycle that continues over and over again. But just because that historical cycle continues doesn't make it right doesn't make it okay. Rise in Islamophobia here in Tennessee alone, I mentioned a few things, you know, back to mosques being burned down, vandalisms. Um, but what we've seen to be very unique now with Islamopho the Islamophobia movement nationally is their shift from this national platform to state platform. And they move away from national issues, and now they're focusing on states' rights issues and preserving security. And the new ta techniques and tactics that they are using, many of us wouldn't even consider. But you're seeing them focusing on issues around zoning. You're seeing them focusing on issues of ed education, immigrations, and schools. I'll talk more about what we're dealing with here in Tennessee. So we know the reality that we are facing with as a, as a nation. And after 9-11, for us as Muslim com the Muslim community, we were at a social and political crossroad. I think for many of us in many communities, we're still at that crossroad trying to overcome it. But what does this mean for multi-faith organizing? What does this mean for multi-faith groups? And what does this mean for us, for those of us in this room and the communities that we serve? What are the questions that we are asking ourselves? And what are the questions we aren't asking ourselves? Before I got into this work and before really getting to the multi-faith movement, some of the questions I asked myself and those that I call allies and supporters were simply this. What is happening around us? Are we willing to question our own beliefs, values, and challenge our own misconceptions and biases in order to stand up for them. And I want you to think about why I say them. Because it's easy, right? As long as it's not us and it's not affecting us directly, then we don't need to worry about them. There isn't an effect on us. But I'm reminded of one of Martin Luther King's greatest coast quotes for me when he said, history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. So if we are people of faith and we deem ourselves to be good people, are we in the streets? Are we in the communities? Are we advocating for issues that don't benefit our own community? Where are you? Where are we? So what has this meant for me? I came to Tennessee in 1991 as a refugee during the first Gulf War. If you had asked me a few years ago Ramzia, you're going to be advocating for your community. You're going to be on the front lines of Islamophobia. You're going to be doing political work. I would look at you and laugh. Think you were insane. Hated politics. I actually wasn't really a practicing Muslim. I wasn't covering. I didn't engage in my community that much. But what shifted for me and what has continued to shift for me, um, and really a turning point in my life uh, was in 2011. In 2011, um, may, maybe many of you are aware, we had the nation's most dangerous anti-Sharia bill in Tennessee. 
this bill made it actually a felony for anyone who was accused of practicing Sharia. Um, if you were accused of practicing Sharia, you would be punishable by law. So for Muslims, Sharia is our basic tenets of, of life. It tells us how to be good Muslims. It tells us to feed the poor. It tells us how many times we pray. It tells us where our inheritance goes. It tells me as a Muslim woman, I don't have to work and I can just keep my man's money. Uh, the things that I enjoy. Um, things that they didn't want to share. But as a Muslim, if you practice Sharia, you would be jailed. And anyone who supported an organization or institution that promoted Sharia or was considered as a group, you could be fined and incarcerated. So all of our lovely interfaith potlucks, if you took cookies to a mosque that was accused of practicing Sharia and has been designated as one of these institutions that could be um, really uh, punished by law, you yourself could face a fine. That was the bill that we dealt with. A year before the anti-Sharia bill, we dealt with one of the most notorious mosque controversies, I would say, in, Americans, in America's history. How many of you have heard of, of the Murfreesboro Mosque? All right, thought so. So the Murfreesboro Mosque, Murfreesboro is actually 45 minutes from here. If you guys have some time, feel free to stop by Murfreesboro. Um, the mosque is about 45 minutes. It was in a small little community that decided to expand. Um, they got all the approvals. They're ready to go, started construction. And then Park 51 controversy took over. Remember Park 51 for the, our New York folks? All right, so the same groups and leaders who were pushing against the Park 51 shifted their attention and focused on Little Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So why did this happen? Why Tennessee? Why Murfreesboro? For goodness sakes, most people can't even pronounce Murfreesboro or don't even know where it is on the map. The political environment in Tennessee allowed for it to flourish. That is the reality, that's what we have to acknowledge and we have to be very honest with ourselves. Our political leaders, our elected officials allowed it to be politically convenient for Islamophobes to take over our state. We're not gonna sugarcoat that. Let's say it for what it is. In Tennessee, the Muslim population makes less than 1%. There's only 65,000 Muslims in the state of Tennessee, predominantly being new refugees and immigrants to the state. Most of these are uh, Kurds, Somalis, Arabs, and African Americans. In 2007, I talked about the Columbia Mosque. I, I believe Dawood will be giving a workshop later and discussing his story. Um, if you get a chance, please go into that and listen. In 2007, the mosque was burnt down. We had numerous rise in, in hate crimes against Muslims. In 2010, we dealt with the Murfreesboro Mosque. In 2011, we faced the anti-Sharia um, legislation. When I mentioned earlier that America has uh, really this history of othering a segment of, pop of its population, that's very true for Tennessee as well. And it's also true for Murfreesboro. When the first Catholic church was built in Murfreesboro, the KKK marched in the street against the Catholic church. When the Hindu temple was built up, same protests happened in Murfreesboro. When the first Buddhist temple was established, the same marches took place. And then when the mos mosque was starting its construction, the same vocal, loud, hateful oppositions took place. So Murfreesboro has a history, but the beauty of this history is that those groups, the Catholic community, the Hindu and the Buddhist community were the first to stand with the mosque. They were the first to come out and say, enough is enough. We have been here before. This is not who we are. That is what we are dealing with in Murfreesboro and we are continuing to face new obstacles and lawsuits that have wasted 
hundreds of taxpayer dollars on a lawsuit that won't go anywhere. So what does this mean for you? I've talked a little bit about the national context. I've talked a little bit about the case in Tennessee. But the topic is really, what are some of the, um, where's the role of religion in public ad advocacy, right? Uh, what do we do? How do we overcome this? What are some of the strategies that we have used in Tennessee? So first and foremost, any strategy that you implement, and whether it's combating Islamophobia or any form of xenophobia or hate, it needs to be run by local voices. Your community has to buy in in order for you to transform. Your community has to buy in and your community has to be willing to engage. Your movement and the success of a movement, it's because it's run by locals. As locals, you know what works, what doesn't work, and no disrespect to the national groups, you don't understand the complexities on the ground. What we've seen is national groups come in and they have the best intentions. They'll come in and they actually do more damage for our causes. So the movement and your response has to be run by locals for the locals with national support. National groups and organizations that you might partner with, absolutely an asset, absolutely. I am not taking away um, how impactful and helpful they, have, they are, but at the end of the day, when they go home, they go home, you are still in the middle of the hate. What we did in Tennessee is we, in 2007 and 2008, we saw that a lot of media hits, a lot of articles and op-eds that were happening in Tennessee were really um, articles that were making you think, God, I hate being a Muslim. I'd read some of those articles and I'm like, goodness, this is insane, this is, this is not who we are. And so we realized that the problem wasn't what was being said about us. The problem was we weren't saying it for ourselves. We weren't speaking for ourselves. We weren't producing the op-eds, the articles, or meeting with media to tell our story. We were letting those who knew least about us define us. And so you have to be able to move away from a reactive approach as communicators and social media activists, we're great about reacting. We are experts at reacting when something has already happened. But the question you should be asking yourself is, what do I do before something happens? What is a proactive strategy that I must implement now before this happens? And what we did early on in Tennessee is we created a statewide interfaith network. So we had a statewide interfaith network that was from the various regions across the state that key leaders from across the state took over and led. And when we needed them to respond, they were already ready. They already had built the trust, they already had the conversations, and they were ready to respond when needed. So ensuring that your strategy moves away from constant reaction to being proactive is definitely a priority. The importance of interfaith, intrafaith, and multi-faith. And I use all these definitions because, you know, I've, I've, I've been to a lot of panels, I've done a lot of conferences, um, it's all one and the same. It's all one and the same. When dealing with, for example, Islamophobia, the reality is Muslims cannot be the only spokespeople. Let's be honest. Some Muslims in my own community, I would never put in front of a camera. I would never have them write an op-ed. This is the same for your community. This is a reality that you have to deal with as communicators. The other thing you have to acknowledge is that issues you take on have to be broad issues. 
Stop working on issues that benefit only your community. Stop working on issues that benefit only your community for right now. The issues you have to start getting engaged in is issues that have repercussions for all communities. You know what some of these issues are in your community. Here in Tennessee, immigration is big for us. Healthcare is big for us. Racial justice and incarceration rates are big deals for us. These don't just affect Muslim community. They affect all communities. And realizing that issues, whether it's Islamophobia, religious freedom, whatever you want to call it, are not an issue just for your community, but they're constitutional issues. They're your fundamental rights as Americans and those in residence of the United States. And most importantly, build trust. Build trust. Relationships are not built overnight. And once you are able to start building trust, you can work on broad issues that affect and unite your communities. You have to talk. You have to talk within your community and you have to talk outside of your community. A few years ago, I started being part of this group called the Circle of Friends. The Circle of Friends is a group predominantly of Jewish and Muslim uh, community leaders who come together and have a discussion on whatever we want to talk about. The conversation there was, you know, you start off very fluffy and happy and nice conversations. You build your trust and then you move forward to really serious conversations. For us and many of our community, the elephant in the room was the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And for us to finally sit down after meeting for about a few years before we could have this conversation. That was a big deal, but we had that conversation. A few months ago, I was invited to be on a panel with, by the Jewish Federation. It was an education panel. Um, I was going to share my story as an immigrant, as a refugee who has gone through the public school system and what are some things parents need to be aware of. Just like this conference, there was a campaign to have me removed from that panel. Because some within the Jewish community and the broader community did not support the work that I do. And there was a lot of misinformation, just like Bud provided, <laughs> about me. And it was my friends and supporters and allies and the group from the circle of friends who stood up for me and said, we know her, we know the work she does, and we know what she represents. And it was those Jewish voices who went up against some of their own Jewish community members to stand with a Muslim. That is the beauty of the work that can happen, but it doesn't come overnight, and it's through working, talking, and building trust. What are some other strategies um, media strategy. I talked a little bit about that, so I won't go too much in detail. Your messaging has to remain positive. You guys are probably experts at this. I'm probably just telling you what you already know. But your messaging has to always remain positive. In the face of some of the nonsense that is said about me and my community leaders, the reality is most of the time we smile and move on. Smile and move on. Or if we respond, we know how to respond. Because at the end of the day, those are minor, very vocal minorities that don't represent our community. As media, as working and engaging with the media, exclusives are your best friends. Exclusives are your best friends. If you had come to Tennessee five years ago and picked up the, any major newspaper, you would have seen some very difficult language, rhetoric, even used in our media about Muslims. The reality is that has changed because of the relationships we have built with the local media. 
So we are sharing stories, we are giving opportunities, and now we have shifted, been able to shift the rhetoric in our state and particularly around media because of the relationships we've built with those media leaders, um, but most importantly, because we've allowed ourselves to be accessible. Allowing your community to be accessible to the media um, is definitely something you can do. Social media is your best friend. I'm pretty sure everyone's on Twitter, Facebook, right? A few months ago as well, feels like every month we, have, we literally have something every month in Tennessee, so I have a lot of examples. A few months ago, a county commissioner in East Tennessee posted a picture of a gentleman um, holding up a double barrel shotgun and the quotation was, how to wink at a Muslim. That picture was sent to us by a media contact who said, have you seen this? We saw the picture and rightfully so, um, we led a campaign through social media. We could have, we did a lot of other steps, but the primary campaign was social media. And what we did is we raised a lot of noise, we made a lot of fuss, and we called out the county commissioner, we demanded an apology, we contacted the political parties, um, and we let it be known that this was unacceptable, especially coming from a political leader in Tennessee. While we were leading our, our campaign, we had constituents, Muslim constituents, actually in the district of the county commissioner, contact the county commissioner and meet with him. Within 24 hours of our campaign, we not only got the apology that we demanded, but the county commissioner actually sat down and met with Muslim leaders to discuss not only that incident, um, but also what to do moving forward. Uh, and that was through the work of social media. Just past this past weekend, here in Nashville, uh, a prominent group known as the Tennessee Republican Assemblies was to host one of the leading, most notorious anti-Muslim speakers in the nation, here in my own backyard. Once again, social media became our best friend. We took it to Twitter, to Facebook, find out within less than 24 hours that the speaker actually had pulled out and canceled his appearance to speak at the conference. But the two things that we're, we take as small victories and remarkable victories for what we did was one, we put pressure on the Tennessee GOP for the first time to really come and acknowledge and make a statement about diversity. Diversity in reference to the Muslim community. We demanded that the T Tennessee GOP distance itself from this conference, but we wanted to know where they stood on diversity. And they came out with, for the first time for our community, a statement that was really in support of promoting diversity and how they had been reaching out to the Muslim community. That, for us, was a big deal. For us as well, the movement and the campaign against that was the ability for our community to acknowledge um, the reality we live in, that we have finally some political and advocacy power. And that we can, as citizens, by engaging social media, change the conversation in our favor. Engaging unlikely allies. Sometimes we don't think of other groups we can reach out to. In 2011, the group that helped us the most and gave us some of the votes we needed to stop and amend the anti-Sharia bill happened to be the Tea Party. East Tennessee Tea Party, which is probably the most conservative Tea Party group here in Tennessee, released a statement against the anti-Sharia bill. 
Yeah, it didn't have anything to do with supporting Muslims. But their statement, and back to the discussion, what I said earlier about connecting it with constitutional rights, they saw it as being infringement of rights and really the overreaching arm of government intruding in your personal life. Tea Party. Might not support, many of us might not support them on some issues, but for that issue, uh, we definitely agreed. Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, whatever you deal with has a cost, has an economic cost to your state, to your community, and to what you do. Look at Arizona with the recent bill that they tried to pass. What was the thing that helped stop and get the governor to veto it? It wasn't their social conscience. Absolutely not, let's be really frank. It was the money. It was the Chamber of Commerce. It was the business sector coming out and saying, we're gonna lose money. And whether we wanna, I say this a lot, but the reality is money talks, folks. You have to identify where the campaign that you are dealing with and what is the economic, not only social cost, but the actual physical cost to the communities that you serve. And we have been able to do this specifically in 2011 with the anti-Sharia bill. In the state of Tennessee, hundreds of international students attend our universities. Univers anyone who's worked in universities knows international students bring in the money. They're the group you charge three to four times more than regular students. And now you are having foreign countries looking at our state and saying, you're passing this law that's going to affect some of our students. That's going to have a negative impact on our students and we don't think we can send our international students to you anymore. And internationally, because of the media work that we did, State of Tennessee and Murfreesboro were feeling it economically. It costs to hate. They might be making a lot of money, but at the end of the day, it's costing our communities when hate is allowed to thrive. A final strategy I want you to think about is engaging the youth. Engaging the youth who are the soul of our society, who will become the leaders, who will take over, who will speak up most of the time when we don't want to speak up. I am re reminded of nine-year-old Jenna from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. At the last public hearing, in an attempt to stop the cemetery, their cemetery. So the mosque is there, they have land, they had an initial permit to build their cemetery, and now they went, they were going through the final process. But once again, the Islamophobes made an effort to prevent them from continuing with that. During this hearing, public comments were allowed. And I watched as nine-year-old Jenna stroll up to the podium, confident with her held, head head high, and testify in front of many people three to four times, five times her age. And Jenna said something that, was, that will remain with me forever, coming from a nine-year-old. She said, I was born in Murfreesboro, and I want to die in Murfreesboro. I just want to make sure I have a place to be buried. A nine-year-old. Jenna will be doing my job in a few years. Jenna will be my community leader. Jenna will be my youth activist. Just as we saw with the Civil Rights Movement, just as we saw with the Arab Spring, and just as we see here in Tennessee, it is the youth who are taking the lead. And the reality is, those of us who run organizations and institutions, the last thing we want to do 
is hand over to the youth. But sometimes it is the youth who make the most impact. It is the youth who do not care about the racial, ethnic, religious lines that many of us do. What are the major challenges that we have faced? What are some challenges that I'm probably thinking you are dealing with? For me, my first wake up call was dealing with my own community. It's really easy for me to organize outside of my community, but sure is hard to then organize within. Imagine bringing together numerous cultural and ethnic communities on an issue that they barely know about. Many who come from societies where oppression, persecution by the government is a norm. So the last thing they want to do is engage in the political and civic process. And having to engage and navigate the cultural nuances, the religious nuances, the gender nuances. One of my greatest memories is sitting with elders from <clears throat> imams and elders in our community, mostly men, old men, and telling them why they need to get involved in the anti-Sharia bill. And I remember them telling me, Ramzia, be quiet, it's gonna go away. Be quiet, it's going to go away. The less noise we make, it'll go away. And I remember saying, it is not going to go away. You need to wake up and realize it's not going to go away and we need to engage. The elders in my community could have looked at me and said, we're not gonna listen to her. We're not gonna get our community support. But they believed in what I was saying and they knew I was serious about what I was saying. And they put their full support behind me. It hasn't been easy. Some of the biggest obstacles I deal with is dealing with in my own community. Who gets to say what? When do they get to say it? Where do they get to say it? How do we say it? Does everyone sign off on it? These are questions that I think all of us will deal with. The reality is for us as the Muslim community and those who are combating Islamophobia is that we are up against one of the most well-funded and organized network. It is extremely well connected politically, and they are, they are doing an incredible, yet sad job of feeding off of hate and implementing scare tactics. Probably Saturday, you will get a small glimpse into my life. If you guys haven't been warned, you probably have. The same groups who campaigned to try to get me off of this panel are planning a silent protest outside the hotel. So you will get to see some of the faces that we deal with. For interfaith organizing, what you have to deal with is acknowledging that other communities are not there with you yet. They support your constitutional rights, they support you having your right as American, but they could care less about your religion. They could care less about your religion and what you believe. And this becomes a balancing act for you as activists and advocates. How far do you push your message? When do you stop at promoting your rights and promoting your faith? It is, a, it is an act that I'm still trying to figure out every day. I have to understand the comfort level of my supporters and my allies and my community. I have to acknowledge them at all times. But there are, we have to also know there are times you have to continue even without your friends, even without your supporters, because you can't wait. Your community can't wait. For me, and the, before I talk about this, finally, what we all deal with is that xenophobia and hate aren't going away. It's Muslim issues today. We don't know what will be tomorrow. This is long, hard work. You get burnt out. You are on call around the clock. For us, 
When we go a week without an anti-Muslim incident, we celebrate in our office. We celebrate the small victories. And you have to be able, most importantly, though there are going to be those in your community who will get attacked for standing with you. My Jewish friends, my Christian friends, my atheist friends, and all my other faith friends who stand with me are included in blogs, websites, are called out on radio stations, probably more than I am sometime. We've had our personal information posted. We've had our picture sent everywhere. And we receive your regular death threat. And they're right there with us. So realizing and acknowledging this, I ask you to know that the road ahead of us is very difficult, that we have to stand together. And are you willing to speak up? My faith and my activism go hand in hand. There's no question about it. My religion teaches me that I must stand up against injustice. There's a verse in the Quran that says you must speak up against injustice even if it's against yourself. So I must speak up against injustice whether it's in my community or outside. But I gain strength from my faith and the conviction that I must, I must act even if I don't know what lies ahead. But I know that a collective response is much greater than a single response. Most importantly, I must not forget the sacrifices of those who have come before me. I have to embrace the small victories and continue to fight even when everything seems calm. I'd like to ask you all to join me again in uh, showing appreciation for Ramsey.